So here we go. Uh, in our second series, uh, got on the website and checked out. Again, what we're doing is we're basically looking at all the questions that come in on questiongod.tv and then taking the top four that uh, seem to show up the most. And uh, real quick here, is Christianity really the only way to heaven? Isn't being a good person enough? Um, what about all the other religions? Are they all wrong? Um, and then I like this one. Which God does this go to? There are so many. <laughs> so, um, and then why is it always humans doing the talking for God? I love that question too. And uh, just so you guys know, again, there, I would say just in the last few days, many of the posts were kind of really... Um, saying that, like, who do you think you are to be talking for God and to be answering his questions for him? And I, I know you, you probably don't know us. I mean, obviously, in our infinite wisdom, we are not going to be able to, to give you the grandiose answer that God would give you if he was standing here today. We've never made any, uh, I've said that a couple weeks ago, I'm never going to prove anything to you. But what I do want to share with you <clears throat> is the best that I can uh, from the Bible and from the Christian perspective for the last 2,000 years, the answers to some of these questions. So that's, that's who we are. I don't claim to, I'm not going to prove anything to you. Don't claim that I have all the answers, anything like that. So just, if you've wondered that, just, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat together. But let me, uh, let me read uh, to you a few more of these questions, because today we're, we're, as you can tell by the few of these short questions, what's, what's the difference here between all the faiths that are out there today? And, uh, Here's one, how can anyone be certain of the way when so many people are so convinced that they know God and that God has spoken to them, and yet the diversity of thought, action, and belief could never come from one source? So how can we be certain? Um, here's another one. Is there only one true religion, Christianity? Then why do people have different religions? Like, why would people have different views on faith if there is only one true God and we argue on who is right? Who is right? How do you know what religion is true when they all say that they're right religion and you must join their church to go to heaven? There's another one. What is it about your holy text that makes it any more credible than the others? What makes you, Yahweh, God of the Israelites, any more likely to exist than the Hindu gods? I want to believe, but it seems like an awfully big coincidence that, my, that the God my parents taught me to believe in and the God most popular in the country I was raised in also happens to be the only real one. <laughs> this, is, this is good. Supposing I were raised in Iran, my parents would have raised me to believe in Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Everyone around me would insist that Allah is the one true God and Muhammad is his prophet, just as everyone around me now insists that Yahweh is the one true God and Jesus is his son. It seems as though in either case, most believe what they do because they were raised to and because it's culturally reinforced. Is that a good reason to think something is true? And can I just say, uh, no. <laughs> it's not, but that's a great question. And I think this is a really good question for all of us sitting here today, especially if you call yourself a Christian. Why? Is it because you've never known anything else? Because you grew up in Sunday school and that's just what people taught you? And because, I mean, you really need to do this. We've talked about this, you guys, that many times we ask many, many questions and then as soon as we become a Christian, we don't ask questions anymore. <laughs> And I just want to say, I don't, I don't think that's a wise thing. And because if you don't know what you believe and why you really believe it, you need to dive in and make sure. Uh, that's why you don't need to be afraid to ask. If you have real questions and doubts, ask them. I was talking to a guy, guy after the first service, and he said, man, I, he goes, I'm a Christian. He goes, but I make other Christians feel really weird when I'm around them because I have hard questions. <laughs> and I just want to say that's okay. We don't need to be afraid, and we need to ask them, okay? So I think that's, that's great. Uh, this guy says, uh, or girl, I, I don't know, uh, how do we create inclusive communities where people from all faiths, religious systems of beliefs, and worldviews can love and respect each other without trying to convert each other? When, how can we do that? And then this person says, throughout history, men and women claim that they are receiving messages from God. They preach, they write, they condemn, etc., but as I read of their claims and their true meanings of the gospel, I see huge differences of their interpretations when compared to each other. What is the truth? I see some right, but then I see significant wrongs with these men and women. I'm confused. <laughs> see, it, it, what I love, um, just even though those last two, couldn't we just have an inclusive community where no matter what we believed and everybody believed, we could respect each other and love each other and quit trying to convert each other. And then this person says, man, I, I, when I read these things and I see the, I, but I see huge differences and <laughs> I don't know what to do about that. And so I'm confused. 
And so today, what we're going to wrestle with is, um, what is Christianity? How does Christianity, how does Jesus Christ, really, actually more appropriately, fit into this mix when you got billions of people around the world who believe so many different things? And are they different? Are they the same? Can we all get along? Is one right more than the other? And, and that's what we're going to tackle today. So before I share kind of the Christian perspective, I just want to real quickly show you a video. Um, I was a part of a church back in Detroit called Kensington Community Church in, uh, in Troy, Michigan. And we did a similar uh, a series, and we went around and found some of the religious leaders in, in the Detroit area uh, for Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Judaism. And uh, had many different videos, but I just want to show this uh, real quick one uh, for them, for a person from each perspective of faith to tell you a little bit about what they believe about God, okay? And after we do that, then I'll share um, our message today. So let's watch this. To the Hindu person, God is many different things. Um, because within Hinduism, there's pantheism, there's, you know, there's many different ideas. Krishna is the original form of God, and from him, unlimited incarnations are coming. Vishnu, Narayan, uh, Lakshmi. God also has female form, both male form and female form. The Srimad Bhagavatam states that there are more names for God than there are waves of water on the ocean. So all of those are different forms of God, uh, Jehovah, Allah, Buddha, Rama, Yahweh. Hinduism is uh, a very wide open religion. They're very tolerant of all other religions. You know, they feel that there are, like in Bhagavad Gita, it says there are many paths leading to God, and uh, they're all valid. God or Allah is the source of every blessing, every guidance, every good things, every greatness and, and grace and, and dignity and divinity, a source of peace, source of prosperity, source of salvation, source of success. For us, he is everything. Uh, there is a verse in the Quran that نَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ He is saying that he is closer to us than this vein here the, what you call it, jugular vein, he is just closer. Buddhism is a non-theistic religion, and so we don't have a belief in God, uh, but instead in Buddha nature, which is within each person, and uh, which is something that the Buddha, Shakyamuni, discovered upon awakening. As I as I said, um, he said, something like wonderful and marvelous without exception, all beings are Buddha. Not People don't realize that, and so that's what the practices are about. Yeah. So we look inside for that rather than outside for, and actually Buddhism is called a religion of self-help rather than other help. The concept of God in Judaism is a concept that we don't really understand. As far as we can explain God, God has many names. And the point of every one of God's names is because you can perceive God in a certain way, but that's not God. And I don't know if you've ever seen the film about, I think it's 12 blind men who banged into an elephant. And each one felt a different part of the elephant and thought he was feeling something else. And the truth is, each one was able to describe their limited perspective or perception of what they were banging into, but that really wasn't the elephant. It's the same idea. God created the world. He is, was, will be. That's all we know. He's the power behind all powers. But who is he? How can I define him? The word, the name that we use to define him means undefinable. It just describes a concept of something that's really undefinable. So with our limited human perspective, we cannot define exactly who is God. God is beyond the realm of perspective. Cool. Um, 
so we, before I jump in here today, can we just pray real quick? Because um, I, I just want to let you know, um, I'm just I, sitting with us today after being the first service. I just want to take this really seriously, this topic. Many of you, obviously, I don't know. I don't know if you come from um, another background of faith and pursuit. <clears throat> and, um, and so before we even start, um, I want to pray because if God is knowable, or not, is huge. And if we can know right things about him or not, is huge. And so, um, and I don't know where you're at in your journey, what you believe, what you don't believe, um, but I want to give you a chance to maybe just to open your heart today, to think critically with your mind today, and open up your heart today to God, and say, um, if you have something to share with me, if you could reveal something to me that would help me on my spiritual journey, I want that. So let's just do that. Father, um, uh, again, I, I personally just want to thank you for your love for each person in this room, that you know them, and you know what they believe and what they don't believe. You know what they question. You know where they're at. You know, the desires of their heart. You love them. You've created them. And I just want to ask uh, for your grace to be present in this room for this hour as we're together, um, that you might help us. Because <laughs> we are human, Jesus. We're so infinite. I mean, so finite, excuse me. We're so finite in our ability to see and understand, and we need you. And so thank you. Because you told us you'd be there, and we, I just want to say I believe you're here and just ask you to be gracious in your uh, love and revelation to us. In, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys, let's, uh, let's just start here. I think that one of the things that's really interesting to me is that in this huge world that we have, that 90 to 95 percent of the world population does believe in a God, <laughs> which is really interesting. Uh, God has been around <laughs> Since the beginning of time when people have thought and pursued and all cultures throughout all history. And what's surprising, actually, is how similar we are in what we believe. What's surprising is how similar we are in our morality in two, basically in two areas with all re world religions. And what we believe about the moral law and the fact that we believe that there should be some accountability for how we live our lives both here on earth and in eternity. And so um, I, I think that maybe that's why this is such a tough question. Maybe one of the reasons it's so tough is because we look at the other world religions around and we say, wait a second. I mean, we think the same thing. We care about people. You know, we love all that kind of stuff. And so when Jesus Christ all of a sudden pops on the scene or Christianity and it seems, it, all of a sudden it can seem exclusive and it can seem like, wait, 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 whoa, whoa. So why you guys? Why do you think you have all the right answers <laughs> when all of us are really trying to do good things? And so I, I just want to say I think that's why it's tough because there's real wisdom in all world religions and there's real good in all world religions and we just need to be honest about that. And I would say that <clears throat> from the scriptures, there's, a very, there's an interesting clue actually, <laughs> I think, to why all world religions are so similar in our hearts and why it comes out in our religious pursuits. The first one is in Romans chapter 1, verse 19. It says this, For the truth about God is known to them, to people instinctively. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. From the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky and all that God had made, and they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. It's very interesting to me that we can see his invisible qualities, his divine nature even. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. The second one is found in the very next chapter, Romans chapter 2, verse 14. And Paul is here writing to the Romans. He's writing to the Jewish believer. He says, even when Gentiles, so that would be, again, anybody who is outside of Israel, anybody outside the Jewish nation, even when Gentiles who do not have God's written law instinctively follow what the law says, they show that in their hearts they know right from wrong. They demonstrate that God's law is written within them, for their own consciences either excuse them or 
Tell them they are doing what is right. See, guys, what I love about that verse right there, those two passages, is it would explain why, since the beginning of time, the majority of people in all culture through all history have believed in a God, and that when they pursued this God, when they wanted to try to figure out who he was, they seemed to come up with a similar conclusion. Why? Because apparently God has written in our hearts this knowledge, this ability to actually know what is right and what is wrong. And so um, in studying uh, uh, this week and, and some of the things I found, there is a few people who found out there are eight similar beliefs in moral law through all world religions, in all cultures, through all history. Eight of them. Okay, look at these. Here they are. The first one is this. Don't do harm to anybody. <laughs> the golden rule. Treat others as you want to be treated. That's in every world religion. Second one, honor your parents. That's nice to know, isn't it? Number three, be kind to your brothers and your sisters and the elderly. <laughs> Number four, no sex outside of relationship with your spouse in all religions. Number five, don't lie. Number six, be honest in all your dealings. In other words, don't steal. Number seven, take care of those who are less fortunate or weaker than you. And number eight, dying to self is the path to life. Now, when you read those eight things, see, those are good. I mean, I, I think we can look at all eight of those and go, yes, man, if the world would live that way, that'd be great. And so when people pursue God, they've come up with no matter where you have been in the world. And again, so that's why we should be able to look at each other and say, you know what, and this is a side note here, there are some things we can be arm in arm with, with people of other faiths. Because they believe some of the great things that we believe and we can hold for and we can walk together on those. And so we need to honor each other for their wisdom and the insight that they have. So what does this teach us? Number one, that all, in all world religions, we know what is right and what is wrong. Isn't that interesting? See, I, I find that to be really interesting. That all world religions know what is right and what's wrong. Secondly, we can, it's why we can look at any religion and see the good in it. And so, can I, I just want to uh, kind of side note here as well. For all of you Christians out there, see, we need to be really careful here. Because when people start to challenge why we believe what we do, the, the, the norm, I think, for many Christians is to get really defensive. <laughs> like, we feel like we got to defend Jesus, you know? Here's God behind us going, hey, I think I can handle this. You know, chill. Yeah, I don't really need you to defend me right now. And so, but we, we all get all defensive and we start to just, we, and I think it's maybe because we're not so secure in it. And so we try to belittle anybody else who doesn't believe what we believe. And I just want to tell you, man, that is just, that's just not good, you guys. It's not right. Because I, I do want to say this, too, that Christianity, Christianity has not always been right. And Christianity, throughout the history of its, its existence all over the world, has not always been the thing that we should follow. It's messed up as much as any other people group and any other religion. And here's why. Because there's a form of Christianity, of Christian religion, that is actually a whole lot more like the Pharisees and the religious people that Jesus was trying to condemn <laughs> than the actual life of Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, can I say that again? There is a form of Christianity out there that looks a lot like the one that Jesus was trying to condemn instead of the life that he was trying to live. And what happens all of a sudden in Christianity, we've, we felt like, man, say a prayer really quick so you get to go to heaven and then learn everything you can to prove that you're better than everybody else. And when that happens, Jesus is not pleased. And so we need to be really careful as we look through this and be careful about even our own understanding of how Christianity, now notice I didn't say Jesus, I said Christianity, has done in the last 2,000 years. All right? Now, let's move into it. So what's up with Jesus? What's up with this guy? Because if all the world religions throughout history and culture have been good, have understood the difference between right and wrong, have some wisdom, then why does Jesus cause so much friction? How many of you guys have ever been in a conversation with people and you're talking about God and like everything's cool and then you throw in Jesus? Anybody ever have it, everything change as soon as you throw Jesus into the mix? I mean, his name just changes everything. 
It's kind of like I wondered, Andy and I were talking this week, it's like you ever hear somebody when they're, th- you know, they're, they're hammering something and they hit their thumb and they go, ah, Muhammad, man, you know, Buddha. You know, I mean, we, 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 why, why don't we yell at those guys? You know, why, why are we only yelling Jesus, you know, when we get mad? Uh, I don't know. There's just something funky about his name that's created uh, something inside of us. And so in all the sameness, what's the difference? And I, the first thing I just want to share is, um, I think the first difference, if you really are going to investigate these faiths, is that Muhammad and Buddha and anybody else and Jesus are not equal. And that's, this is where it gets interesting here. There's this one little thing that separates Jesus from the rest of the religious leaders' claims in their pursuits of God. So let's go with this elephant thing. You guys, how many of you guys ever heard the elephant illustration before? Okay, about like half of you maybe or so. So here's this illustration. What it was was a parable to help us to understand why there are so many different world religions. My understanding is that there were four blind guys, and they went up to an elephant, and the one guy grabbed the trunk, right? So he grabs the trunk, he's blind, and he says, man, an elephant is like a hose. And then the other guy gets the leg, and he goes, no, 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 an elephant is like a tree. And then the other guy bumps up against the elephant, and he goes, no. An elephant is like a wall. And then the last guy gets the tail, right? And he grabs it and he goes, no, an elephant is like a snake, right? Now, so there was this elephant, but blind people were trying to figure out what it was like. So they touched it and they they did the perspective. Now, I actually think that there's some really, really good truth in that parable, okay? Because if if you were blind, and, and let's say for religion, If you're trying to pursue in your humanity God, that's like what the guy from Judaism said, right? He goes, it's so unexplainable. And so in your humanity, if you're trying to say, this is what God is like, I'm going to pursue God and I'm going to figure him out, then I would agree. The best you're going to come up with is a leg or a tail or a piece of it. You're never going to really know God. But you're going to be able to give a piece of that. And that's, again, why I think we can look at all world religions and say, yes, I see, I, good, okay, right. Now, here's the difference, though, possibly, right? There's no way that you could actually know what that elephant was like or you could know what God was like unless one thing has happened. And that has, that is, has God ever actually revealed who he is? See, there's a difference there. Human pursuit of God, I would agree, is only going to be able to get part of it. But if God has revealed himself, then we can actually know him. Okay, so just hang on with me. This is why I think Jesus Christ um, freaks people out. Because Jesus didn't pursue God. You're never going to see him pursuing God. He claimed to be God. And that's totally different than any other religious thought or faith. See, in many faiths, what happened is people received a revelation from God, right? And so they said, okay, this is how we can know God, you guys, and we're going to pursue him. And I've received this revelation from God, and now we're going to share that with everybody and learn about that. Jesus didn't say that he received a revelation. He said, I am God. The revelation. Okay. That's different. And that's what we've got to deal with here. And you guys, this has always been the issue. Even when he was walking here, walking on the earth in, in the flesh, people couldn't handle the claims that he was making. The guy, this guy's nuts. You know, are you kidding me? And so if you've never looked at this, look at this with me. And now we can see why Jesus causes such a ruckus in the world, okay? We're going to start off in John chapter 8, starting with verse 45. And Jesus, uh, in both these accounts I'm going to give you, he's talking with these religious leaders, the people who got it, man, the really sharp, intellectual, sharp, religious, spiritual, into God people. And he says this, yet, because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. And then he says, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Can you guys do that? (laughs) uh, They don't answer that question. Can you prove me guilty of sin? And then he says, sorry, my Bible's small here. Uh, I am telling, if I, if I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. 
And the reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. So the Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? <laughs> See, now this is great. See, now basically what they're saying is, aren't we right in saying you are totally out of your mind? I mean, that's what they're saying. Listen, we've been listening to you and you are wacky. Aren't we right in saying that? And Jesus says, I am not possessed by a demon. He goes, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. And I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this, the Jews exclaimed, okay, now, now we know. <laughs> You're demon-possessed. <laughs> you are so out of your mind. Abraham died, and so did the prophets, yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Come on, man, he died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Isn't that awesome? Right there it is. 2009, October 11th, people are going, who do you think you are, Jesus? He got the same questions 2,000 years ago. And he replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. <laughs> but I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Wait, 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 wait a second. <laughs> you aren't even 50 years old, the Jews said to him. And you've seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Okay. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away to the temple grounds. See, now, if you don't understand Jewish history, when Moses, when God called Moses to, to lead his people out of Israel, Moses said, well, wait a second here. God, I'm, I'm going to go over there. They don't know me. Who am I? And who am I supposed to tell them sent me? You know? And God said, I am. <laughs> Tell him, I am. When the, Ju the guy for Judaism, when he said, the term for us to try to explain God means he's unexplainable. That's I am. I am is I'm everything. I am over all of it. And so Jewish people, that's their word for God. And here Jesus said, well, before Abraham was born, I am. Do you guys see what he was saying? They did. They grabbed rocks. They said, you're going down. Because <laughs> you're demon possessed. <laughs> you're wacky. Let's go to the next one. Chapter 10. Verse 24, next encounter. The Jews gathered around him and they said, Hey, listen, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did. I did tell you. But you don't believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you don't believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice and I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And again the Jews picked up stones to stone them. But Jesus said, oh, wait, 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 wait a second. I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Well, we're not stoning you for any of those, replied the Jews. But for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So you guys, this is the issue with Jesus that you are not going to find in any other world religion. You're going to find pursuit of God. You're going to find God revealed things. But you're never going to find anybody who said, actually, I am God, except Jesus. And that's why we need to look at that because, man, if that's true, then that's different. It's not trying to figure out what the leg or the tail or the nose is. It's, it's the elephant saying, here I am. So there are a couple things that were claimed here. Just a few verses later in chapter 10 and verse 37, Jesus said, and I love this because there's such a humility and a gentleness to Jesus too, even when he's being strong. But he said, he says this, 
do not believe me unless I do what my father does. Isn't that cool? I, I actually really like that. Jesus wasn't just saying, hey, take it me for, you know, because I said so. He says, don't believe me unless I do what my father does. Now, there were some pretty wacky claims here again. Because one of the things he did is he claimed, things that to, he claimed that he could do things that only God could do. The first one was in uh, chapter 10, 28. He says, I'll give them eternal life. <laughs> Come on. See, this is where we go. This guy was a good teacher. Are you kidding me? I'll give you eternal life. Do you, do you know anybody else who's making that claim? See, that's crazy. Now, we do in all the other world religions, it says, I'll show you the way to eternal life. And that's why, you guys, when people say, man, Jesus was a good example, I'm like, no, he wasn't. Because <laughs> if I follow his example, that means I get to give you eternal life. See, that's crazy. I'm not telling you that I'm God. That's not a good example. This guy's weird. The second thing he said is that he could forgive sins. And, and, and again, the religious people go, wait a second. Who do you think you are that you can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus would say, well, it doesn't matter. I forgive you. I forgive you of your sins. He would claim it. And then again, which we just read, he says, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Can you imagine coming here to K2 and I'd say, hey, if any of you keep my word, you will never see death. You know, hopefully you would never come back. <laughs> I mean, hopefully you would never walk through these doors again and go, and, what, and, and here's the question though. Why would you never walk through these doors again? You go, that Nelson dude, he's out of his mind. I don't know who he thinks he is. But Jesus would say that. And then, so not just did he claim those things, and then he said, and, and I love this, he goes, if I he, uh, don't believe me unless I do what my father does. And then he said in verse 38, but if I do it, even though you don't believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I'm in the father. Again, I love his respect that he has for humanity, his respect that he has for people's need to reason and to think. And so he looks at them and he says, listen, even if you don't believe me, then believe the miracles so that you can understand and know that the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. I'm not another religious leader. And so what were some of the miracles? I mean, he raises, Jesus, uh, raises Lazarus from the dead after three days. Unbelievable. He heals people by a spoken word or by a touch who wouldn't be healed for years. He has authority over demonic oppression. Demons would have to leave just at his voice. Who can do that? He walks on water, right? He feeds 5,000 people with a couple fish and a few loaves of bread. See, that this is just, I mean, what he was trying to do is, I just want you guys to know I'm a little different than the average religious leader guy. I just, I just want you to know, so believe in the miracles when you see them. The third thing is his in character and his integrity. So in, in John chapter 8, verse 46, he looked at these guys and he says, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? And, isn't, and, and they're, uh, let's go to the next question. I mean, see, even when he was getting in the trial, they had to set up men to try to bring up false accusations against him because they couldn't find anything wrong with the guy. Go ahead. What did I do wrong? Show me one thing. We can't, well, we, we can't find that. Okay, so there's something about his character and his integrity that was off the charts. And then his wisdom and his insight. When you read the Gospels, you guys, here were the top religious leaders, the best human thinkers, the people who supposedly knew God, and over and over and over again, it says they would test him with questions and they'd try to trap him with questions and they'd question him with all these deep theological stuff. And then Jesus would answer him and then in every gospel says, and they dared not ask him any more questions. <laughs> because they just, they couldn't match his intellect and his wisdom and his insight. So, for years... My wife tells me it started with C.S. Lewis. If anybody knows differently, you can tell me. For years, what people have said then is if you're going to look at Jesus, you have to make a few decisions. First one is this. Is he a liar? Is he a liar? See, because he's claiming to be God. 
So either he was lying, but wait a second, a guy who they can't find any moral problem with is probably not a guy who's out there lying. <laughs> but maybe he is. Okay, so let's say he was a liar. But let's say you go, no, I don't, I don't think he was lying. Okay, well, if he wasn't lying, then the second thing you have to ask is, well, then was he a lunatic? Because <laughs> this guy's out of his mind. This guy is claiming some really wacky stuff that anybody today that would claim the same things Jesus would, we'd put him away and we'd just laugh at him. And so you sit there and you go, well, probably not somebody who was that sharp and had that much wisdom and that much insight, who had that much charisma and poise that thousands of people would want to follow him and that the top religious people and the government officials as well couldn't even stand to his intellect. Does that match a lunatic? I don't think there are many lunatics around who have that much insight, character, wisdom, and integrity. So you go, okay, well, wait, wait, okay, so if he's not lying and he's not a lunatic, then who is this guy? And that's why they've said, then maybe he really was God. And that's what we have to deal with. And that's what we have to look, with, look at and see the differences. So that's the first one, you guys. Is Jesus Christ really the only way? Well, I would say if he's God, then his weight carries a little more than people who are trying to pursue God. If he was really God, then that means he did reveal who God was instead of receiving a revelation about who God was. And, and so I just want to say, if you're going to investigate all the world religions, when you get to Christianity, that's what you have to deal with, is who Jesus was, how he lived his life, and the claims that he made. Okay? So there's a difference there. Now, here's the second issue, and it's the issue of salvation. Because there's another title that Jesus was given, and it was Savior. Luke chapter 2, verse 10, when the angels came to declare to these shepherds, um, that Jesus was going to be born. It says, the angel said to them, don't be afraid because I bring you good news of great joy that will be for who? All the people. See, and this, I'm, I'm, we're going to get to this at the end. All the people. All the people in all cultures, in all time, who've been seeking after God and who know that there's right and wrong. There's somebody who's coming for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born, and he's Christ the Lord, a Savior. See, John 3.16, which is the classic Christian verse, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his own and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved who? The world. <laughs> the world that was pursuing him. The world that wanted to know what was true. The world who in their heart was saying, I think I know the difference between right and wrong. That world... He goes, I'm doing this so that everybody, whoever would believe, wouldn't perish but have eternal life. But look at verse 17. Here's the key. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to do what? But to save it. See, so here's another uniqueness that makes Christianity different than the rest of the, rest of the deal. Can you imagine? <laughs> I just, while we were thinking about this, I, I, I sat there and I all of a sudden kind of imagined the Titanic, okay? You guys, anybody see the Titanic, right? And you saw the, the ship's going down and everybody's jumping. Can you imagine uh, a Jesus up on the Titanic and he's looking down and he decides, oh my gosh, these people are perishing. So he dives into the ocean, right, to save everybody. And yet everybody's sitting in their uh, inner tubes, you know, uh, let's just say they're in inner tubes and they're just kind of like, dude, what is up with that guy? <laughs> I mean, who does he think he is, right? Who do you say you think you are? And apparently Jesus thought he was the savior of the world. <laughs> I mean, come on, are you kidding me? Again, this guy's, what a joke. I'm in my inner tube. I'm fine. I don't need you. I would say in 2009, don't you think most people just say, what is, what, what, what's up with this Jesus guy? Leave me alone. I don't need to be saved. But what if Jesus dove in because when he was sitting up on the boat, he saw a school of sharks that were coming. And you're sitting in your inner tube and you didn't know that? And you're like, come on, dude, leave me alone. I don't need a savior of the world. And Jesus goes, no, actually, you do. So again, one of the uniquenesses, if we're going to look at, aren't we all the same? Yes, 
We're all the same in understanding what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. We are not all the same when you look at them about what we do with the fact that we're not good. <laughs> and most people don't think you need to be a, that you need a savior, but Jesus came in and said, actually, you do. See, because if we go back and we look at what the, all the world religions have taught us, they teach us that we all know what is good and what's right and what's wrong. But the other thing, you guys, they teach us is that we're royal screw-ups <laughs> because the world isn't getting better. I mean, there are more wars and more people hurting each other and more murder and more divorces and more break. I mean, there's more pain. It doesn't, you know, we're not getting better here. So basically, we know what the right thing is to do, and it's not helping <laughs> a whole lot. And so I think this is where all of a sudden we realize, man, we need God's help. We sit there and we go, how do, I, how do I set right everything that's wrong? How do we fix everything that's broken? And see, and here's the other thing, you guys, is once all of a sudden you know what's right and what's wrong, then don't you have a, do you guys ever get this conscience? <laughs> when you do, like, especially when we're young, we have a good one. You know, we have a de decent conscience. And we go, man, it's just, oh, I feel bad. Like, if you still have one of those consciences when you do stuff, what do you do with that bad feeling inside of you that says, this isn't good and this isn't right? See, what's interesting is God offers himself to the solution to the problem because what world religions have had to say is, what am I going to do with this problem? Because the one thing I know is I know what's right and wrong, but the other thing I know is that I never actually reach that standard. And that you've got to deal with. If I went through those eight things that every world religion believes in, and we actually went and we said, okay, how are you doing on each one of those? <laughs> See, all of us in this room would have to go, uh, and I blew it. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't do that that well. And maybe on some you go, well, I'm pretty good at that one, though, but I'm not good at that one. And here's the question. Like, how many times can you do something wrong over and over again before you actually become bad? <laughs> Right? How, and when you know it, I'm good, I'm good, I know I screw up a lot, I'm good, I'm good. Oh, boom, oh, that was it, I'm bad. You know, I remember doing youth ministry. It was so interesting working with high school kids because you'd get kids and, you know, they're, 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 they're in, a, they're in a, a mess of problems. You know, they're, they're struggling with drugs and alcohol. They've, they've, they're actually up. I've, I'd had, I would have kids that were in penitentiary, and then the mom would come up and say, but he's a good boy. And I always wanted to sit there and I'd say, um... When do you not become a good boy? Seeing with every world religion, you know what's right or wrong, but when you don't know for sure when you're not good anymore, you know what has to happen? Eventually, then you have to make up your own standard. I think that this is when I'm good enough. And I'm not sure then, and I don't know about you, though, because I know things about you. And we start making judgments on other people. And you guys, I just want to say, I don't want to live my life wondering when I've done the bad thing one too many times wrong. And that's when God's going to go, mm -mm. okay, that was enough. You were good up till then. <laughs> but now I don't know. So what do we do? We keep the five pillars. We try to do the eightfold path. We try to keep the Ten Commandments. And then the more we try to keep them, the more we realize what? I can't do it. I can't do it. And so, you guys, what happens? Now, this one guy I was reading this week, he said what happens is we've got to figure out what to do with this problem. And so almost all religions in the world will fall into two camps. One is where God is kind of aloof. He's kind of far away from us. And he's the God that all of a sudden religious, religions turn very legalistic. And you got this God who's far away from you and he's demanding that you do certain things to please him. And you got to follow these things. You got to do everything that's right. And then when you get before me, we'll see. Seriously. Do you really want that? But that's one option. I'm going to prove that I'm good enough while I'm down here in hopes that I've pleased this God who stands as my judge. The other possibility not just that he's aloof that leads to legalism. The other possibility is that he's not personal. He's, not an, he's a very impersonal God. And if that's the case, you guys, then it leads to fatalism because basically it doesn't matter what you do. So like humanism, all of a sudden, it's like, well, I didn't come from anything and I'm not going anywhere and so there's really no purpose in life. Or even, even with reincarnation, the thought that, okay, how'd you do? Okay, 
Now, when you come back, now we're going to try this. And then you're going to come back and you're going to try this. And it just keeps going and it's circular instead of linear. It, all of a sudden, it's like, is there a purpose in life? And, and sometimes you'll hear some people of religious faith say, well, there's really not a purpose in life. There's really not a God. It's just you trying to figure out what you're, and I'm like, then why does every human being want to have purpose in their life? And so you really have these two options of a, of a fatalism instead of a freedom where it's all laid out for you instead of being free to live and love and choose God. Or you have this God who's aloof creating this legalistic thing that's just a pain. And what I realized, you guys, this week, and this is why it's different, is that none of those things are about relationships. None of those things are about relationship. If you were here last week, at least I don't know exactly what Christian said, but I know that as we work through this idea of why there's pain and evil and suffering in the world, it's because God so wanted to be in a love relationship with you, and the only way there can be love is if there's choice. And that's the world that we live in, is a world of love. God wants to be close to you. So it's interesting to me that when people tried to pursue God, the one thing they came up with was, you know what? There's things that are right and there's things that are wrong. And now I got to try to figure out how to get to God and how to please him and how to live a good life down here. And here's what Jesus said. It's not about that. It's not about you. Yes, I put that in your heart so you know you would never be able to meet that standard. But the reason I did that was so that when I would send my son into the world, you would know you need a savior. And I am the one coming to you. One guy I studied this week, he said, just do this. He goes, look, look at every other, check out every other religion and see if there is a God who is pursuing you with his love. Just check that out. What's so unique about Jesus? The uniqueness about Jesus was he was the one who came and said, it's not you trying to appease me. It's me coming to take care of you. I love you. Is you are you the only way? I'm the only way to a relationship with God. I'm not the only way, apparently. Can we say this? Can we agree on this? Jesus is not the only way to morality, right? There's a lot of good morality going on. Jesus is not the only way to wisdom. There's some good wisdom going on. But what Jesus came to say is, I am the only way to be in an intimate, tight, every moment of every day, life-changing and altering relationship with God. And that's why you're here and that's why I came. See, so it's not so much about getting to heaven and going, hey, God's up there, man, I'm sorry, dude, the answer was C and you put A. Or, you know, the, you put down, the, you filled the blank wrong. No, it's about God saying, I created you and I am your life. And I sent Jesus to bring you back to me so that we could live like this. Let me just read you two last passages before we close. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, and the old has gone and the new has come. And all of this is from God. You guys, don't miss that. I just kind of want to climb on a ladder. And all of this is from God. Again, check out every other world religion that has morality and wisdom to it. But is it all from God? Jesus says, it's all from me. He says, it's all from God who reconciled us. See, reconciliation, you guys, is a relational term. It's not about following a set of principles. It's not proving something to God. It's not doing what he says. It's, it's he reconciled us to himself through Christ, and then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling who? The world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he's committed to us this message. See, is Jesus different? Yes, because no other religion is saying that there's someone who came 
to take on your sin so that you can chill and rest and know without a shadow of a doubt that you're reconciled to God. I'll tell you, I need that. I need to know that I'm good with God because I'm not that good. Are you? I need him. 1 John 4, 7, actually, if, uh, if you guys could just ship to, skip excuse me, to verse 9. It says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. See, again, you guys, it's not just so I can go to heaven. Or it's not just so I can, no, it's so you can live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as the one who would turn aside his wrath and take away our sins. So that's what I just, I, I wanted to share with you guys today is that the uniqueness about Jesus is that Jesus is love, you guys. Is, is every, again, check out the other faiths. And is that a God who's saying, I'm crazy about you and I love you and I would die for you. I know you don't even care about me and I still love you and I'm merciful and I'm gracious and I'm slow to anger. That's the God I want. The God who comes to us to rescue us so that we can be his children forever and so that he can live with us every moment of every day. This is love. It's why we're here. It's what we're created for. And I think it's the uniqueness of Jesus. So again, in pursuing world faiths, it makes all the sense in the world if you're trying to pursue God and figure him out and go by a revelation that a human being had. But it's different, you guys, than getting to know the one who revealed him to us. And that's what I just want to encourage you to consider today as we close the service. And um, Ben, you guys can come on up. And so here's, here's what we're going to do. Just, we just have one song today. We're, just going to, we're going to do it differently today. And here's, here's what I want you to do. In this song, I love, the, I love this song. It's going to give you a great chance just to sit with this for a minute. And it's going to say, maybe you're right. <laughs> maybe you're right. Maybe Jesus just was a good man. Or maybe he was just a good teacher. See, again, I would say by what I share with you, uh, I don't know, but maybe you're right. But then what the song says, but maybe you're wrong. And I hope you'll hear that gently because what it's saying is maybe there's way more hope than you ever imagined. Maybe it's actually all about love. And maybe there is a God who sent his son into the world, not to condemn it, but to save it from its effort to try to be good enough and instead bring us back into relationship with him. Maybe that's right. 